has such a cool story about the young man and kind of the, the miracle at the till. And it, it kind of made me think, like, I, I bet there's a bunch of us out there that wish, man, I wish that God would give me a miracle like that. Like, I'm, I'm ready for my miracle. But the thing is, is that we want the miracle without the sacrifice. See, he put the sacrifice in, and then he got the miracle. So the miracle meant something because there was sacrifice behind it. But we often want the miracle. We don't want to do the sacrificial part where we give something up. But what good is the miracle if you haven't first sacrificed? So anyway, that's not even today's sermon. That was just something that I was thinking about. And I do like to think a lot. I, I am a, a, a piddler as I think through things. I really enjoy overthinking some things. Some things are really bad to overthink for me. But a lot of things are great. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about this. There's um, a guy that trains me during the week. His name is David. I'm going to continue using examples of him until he sits on the front row with me. But <laughs> da David trains me. And oftentimes I find myself looking for ways to stall him or ways to delay him because I'm, I'm exhausted or I can't do the next set. And he's kind of saying, you know, come on, Chris, let's go. But I think, okay, if I can distract him, then that'll buy me a few more seconds to catch my breath or to recuperate. And one of the things that I like to do with David is I will ask, the gym's a, an amazing place to watch people, right? I don't know if, if you guys go to the gym, just pause and watch people. Don't be creepy about it, but it's this incredible place where you can just watch people. And I, and I like to do that. And so I'm constantly asking David, David, why is that person sitting that way? Why, why are they uh, turned around backwards on that machine? Or why are they, you know, this or that? And he's just constantly answering my questions. And one day I was sitting there and trying to stall. And I, I asked, I said, David, why do you think that person has those shoes on? And David was like, I have no idea why they're wearing those shoes. And I'm like, do you ever think about that? And he's like, no, never, you know, but I do. <laughs> Because I, I, I think, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I choose what I wear for a reason. And so I think, hey, there's, this person chose what they wore for a reason. I wonder what that is. David's like, come on, we've got to do the next set. So I, I like to overthink things. And I like to think about things. And as I was also thinking about the church, and I've been thinking about the church for a long time, and in a specific way, but as I think about this, it's like the church actually... When I start to really unpack it, this church thing is an absolute miracle. See, the, this church is a miracle. We should not be here. We should not be gathered as a group of people under this roof with lights on and singing worship music. In fact, there should not even be worship music. There should not be written worship music. This word should not even exist. I should not be standing up here. All over the world on Sundays, there will be millions and millions and millions of people that gather for a Sunday service, for a church service. But, but it, it actually should not be. It, it shouldn't be something that happens. There shouldn't be a kum books and there shouldn't be literature that we can read. There should not be a printed Bible. None of that stuff should actually be here. And, and I'll explain by kind of reading a couple statements to you because I want you to wrap your head around this idea that that we take for granted the fact that we're here because it's Sunday morning and you get up and you come to church. But actually, it's kind of absurd. If you look at the details and the things that led to us becoming a church together and us calling a building church or us calling people the church, if you look at the details that led up to that, then this thing truly is an absolute miracle. So let me reframe this for you with, with this statement here. So... How did a first century cult, because when you think about the way that, that Christianity, or as they called it, the way, before the, the, the church of Antioch was, was born, it was recognized as the way, but it was kind of seen as like this little cult, this, this kind of almost seen as like a, well, it was seen as a very negative thing, but how did a first century cult birth in the armpit of the Roman Empire, because Judea, where it came from, the Romans considered that the absolute armpit of its empire. So if you were a soldier and you were stationed in, in Judea, you knew that you did something wrong. But how, how can a, a first century cult birth in the armpit of a Roman Empire, whose leader, Jesus, was rejected by his own people and then crucified? So that, that's Christianity, okay? Birth in an armpit, we crucified the leader, our own leader, we crucified him. So how can that survive and thrive in the face of violent, organized resistance? So just that statement there kind of brings to light like, oh, wait a minute. It kind of maybe is a miracle that the church has survived all of these things. So we, I've got another way to rephrase this for you. So we'll go here. How did it come about 
that a Nazarene sect, because Jesus of Nazareth, it was, it was known as this tiny little thing. Nazarene's not even on the map. So this is insignificant. How did it come about that this insignificant group would eventually be embraced by the very empire that for 300 years sought to extinguish it? And what it's talking about there is that the Roman Empire spent 300 years persecuting and trying to extinguish the movement that would become the church. And 300 years later, they would end up embracing it. How, how is that possible? How is it possible that right now in the Roman Colosseum, there is a cross position to commemorate the Christians? How, how can it go from a place of persecution and killing to a place of commemorating and remembering those that lost their lives there? How, how is it possible, especially when it comes from this tiny little town out of this weird guy that managed to get a bunch of people to follow him? How on earth did we go from here to where we are now? So when you start to unpack that, then you start to realize maybe this is kind of crazy that we're here. Maybe this is a bit ridiculous or this is kind of a miracle that the church was born. Now, this is something that not only you know, I've thought about and struggled with, but historians have, have thought about this and they've struggled with trying to make sense of this for a long, long, long time. See, historians study the rise of movements across the world and then the fall of movements, the rise of kingdoms and the fall of kingdoms. Why did it happen? How did it happen? In fact, funny thing, I was a history major at the University of Tennessee uh, in, in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I went to university. I graduated from there, and I could not tell you three things about World War I. So I did not know that my education served me very well. I think more than anything, it just taught me how to work hard. But... But these, these history people, and I know these people because I used to have classes for them. I have to write papers for them. They're miserable people. And if you're one of those people, then you need prayer. <laughs> but they would just make us just dig and dig and dig and try and make sense of the history. And I'd be like, why are we doing this? But anyway, they, they can't figure this thing out. And, and in fact, I was listening to, to Andy Stanley was talking about this. And he actually pulled this quote from a historian, Karen Armstrong, from a book that she wrote, Filled with Blood. And I thought, well, I've got to include this because this is so good. Against all odds, by the third century, Christianity had become a force to be reckoned with. We still do not really understand how this came about. Isn't that crazy? See, it's not just... At, how much brain space have you given to thinking about the miracle that we sit here today in a church and as a collective church? Yeah, this is something that, that people in the secular world and historians, they cannot figure it out. So we can figure it out. And the way that we know it is we have this sort of this secret weapon. It's not really a secret weapon, but it's this tool. And it's this amazing, amazing tool. And what this is, is these are the first handwritten accounts of the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's the first handwritten accounts of his ministry, of everything that he did, everything that he said, and everything that he taught. And in fact, it was the same group of men that documented the death of Jesus that would be the same group of men that would document the birth of the church. And they would even document the fact that it was an underdog story. See, the, these same disciples that walked with Jesus and told us about his ministry and researched it and wrote it down and told us about what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks about the death and resurrection of Jesus, they would then go on to be the same people that would tell us how the church would form. And we see that in Acts. If you look at the book of Acts, Luke gives the, the whole story of how the church kind of unfolds in there. See, we have something that is inarguable. And it is these written truths. It's not that the Bible told me so, therefore I believe that this happened. It's that it happened, and we decided that this needed to be pulled in, and the Bible would come out of that. So, we're, we're going to look at the first time that the church was mentioned. The first time that the church was mentioned as we see it today. And, and this is such a cool set of verses. But this is the time when Jesus would actually speak the church into existence. So we sit here today because of what we're going to read in Matthew chapter 16. So let's look at that. Matthew 16, verse 13, 
So Jesus, he, him and his disciples, let me set the scene for you. They're, they're cruising. They're walking around. He's got his group. He's got the 12 around him. But he also has a whole bunch of other people, men, women. Jesus had a ton of followers. We often think about just the 12. But there were a bunch of people that followed Jesus. This is why Jesus was considered uh, a rabbi, because a rabbi was a teacher who then recruited disciples, recruited people that would learn underneath them. So Jesus was a rabbi. That's why I go back, and we've talked about this week after week, that when Jesus died on the cross, before he resurrected, he was just a rabbi. Because there was just Jesus walking around with people following him. It was the resurrection that brought him into being the Son of God. So anyway, Jesus is walking into Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples, what do people say the Son of Man is? So he's saying, hey, what do people say about me? What do you, you guys have got your ear to the ground. What do you hear? What do, what do people say about me? And they replied, some say that you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah. And they go on to list and say they even think that maybe you're other prophets that, that have come back. And so then in the next verse here, Jesus asks his disciples, he pauses. And I like to imagine this is like a dramatic pause. Maybe he just pauses and they all kind of stop and he turns and he says, but what do you or who do you say? that I am. Who, who do you, my disciples, my followers, say that I am? And then Peter, Peter speaks up and he answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So this is the first time in the Bible that Jesus is recognized by a human, by, by man on earth, man or woman, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. It's the first time it happens right here. When Jesus asks this, and Peter says it, and Jesus recognizes that this is the first time that it's ever been said. And so he says in the next verse, in verse 17, he says, Jesus replied, Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. So that's Peter. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So he's saying there's no way that you could have known this, because no one has known this before you. No one could have told you this because no one else knew. You're the first. And my Father in heaven, God, put these words in your mouth. Put these words in your heart. You said this. I'm sure Peter's feeling like, I'm the man. Like, I, yeah, you know, I am the favorite. Take that, John. You know, it's, they competed with each other a little bit. So Jesus is like, hey, that, that, that could only come from God above. And when that happens, it's like that was the spark. And Jesus said, okay, now the world is ready for it to be more than just Peter but for it to also be the rest of the world. And so Jesus, in the next verse, he speaks this thing into existence. And he says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. See, we, there's a lot of debate about what the rock is that Jesus is building his church on. Is he building it on Peter? Is he building it on the truth that Peter spoke? Is he building it on, on other things? But you know what? There, there's a lot of smarter historians out there that can debate that. I think we can look at it quite simply and say that when Jesus said, I will build my church, he spoke the church into existence. See, that, that's why it's crazy that we're, that we're here. We're only here because Jesus spoke it into existence. Otherwise, this thing would not have lasted. That's why I started this thing with saying, if you think about it, it's crazy that the church is even here, that we're here. There should not be worship songs written, but because Jesus spoke it into existence, there is. There shouldn't be a stage that we stand on. There should not be a Bible that's printed. There shouldn't be any of this stuff that we participate in that we call the church, community groups, all of that stuff. But it is because Jesus spoke it into existence. Now, the second part of this verse is, is even cooler. This is, this is a great part. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So he's not talking about hell. H Hades is not... Hell, it's, it's known as just a place of death, a, a place of death. And so Jesus is saying, I'll build my church, and guess what? There is no death that will overcome it. My death will not, it, my, my death will not overcome it. The church is going to happen because I'm going to rise and resurrect. Jesus is saying, Peter, your death will not overcome the birth of the church. My death will not overcome the, the birth of the church. There is no death out there. There is no death in any person that will overcome what I'm going to do in bringing the church into existence. So Jesus is speaking the church into existence for the first time ever, and he's saying, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing, not even death, 
that can overcome what he wants to do as the church. And so where that leaves us is in a very exciting position. We get to be the fulfillment of this promise. That's us. See, you sitting in this chair today, whether you're new, maybe this is your first time coming. And in fact, if this is your first Sunday with us, this is perfect. This is the perfect Sunday to be a guest because here we are talking about who we are and talking about why we are. And if you don't know those questions, then we're going to answer them all today. But for those of you that have been here a ton of times and those of you that know exactly what I'm talking about, we are the fulfillment of that promise. When you walked in these doors, when you sat down in this chair, you sat down as a fulfilled promise. That when Jesus spoke the church into existence, he spoke your chair into existence. He spoke you sitting in that seat today, freely, on May 15th. He spoke that into existence. We are the fulfillment of that promise. Now, I just think that that's amazing. That the church came from something that it should have never, it should have never made it through it. And it did. It should have never uh, outlasted the Roman Empire. It should have never outlasted all, all the things. It didn't come out of, out of this famous town with a ton of money backed behind it. No. It was just uh, this one man named Jesus who, who motivated and raised up a bunch of people around him and that walked with him. And he did miracles and he did all these things. But when he resurrected himself, when he rose from the grave, it brought everything that he had ever said it, it, it fulfilled all of it, and it validated everything that Jesus ever stood for. And I just think that's amazing that I get to stand on stage as a pastor because I'm part of the fulfillment of this promise. And it just makes me think, I wonder how many people out there don't know that they can be a part of the fulfillment of this promise. There's a lot. There's a lot of people. So Jesus doesn't just speak about the existence of the church. He then is going to go on to actually define it. So Jesus doesn't speak it into existence. He actually defined it. So th this is where I have been having this, this, this incredibly increasing burden in my heart for us as a church. And when I say the church, I mean us as people. See, th this is not just a job to me. Y you matter to me. You're important to me. And I know that there's a lot of other people that you're important to and that you matter to. It it's, not, it's not just a Sunday thing. It's more than that. It goes deeper than that. It goes beyond that. And where it starts is it starts with loving God. So this whole thing, the, it starts here. And we know this because, see, Jesus, he wanted to do something unique and special in your heart. I mean, our, our whole Sunday morning, we set up the worship and the, and the preaching, and we set all this stuff up so that you have an opportunity to experience the love of God. I, I remember being a little kid and laying in bed at night, and I had not given my life to Jesus. And I would lay in bed at night, and I would stare at the ceiling, and I was a part of church, I was a part of a youth group, and, and I knew who God was, I knew everything, I knew a ton of stuff about Jesus, but had not given my life to Him. I had not said, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. And I would lay there, and I, I can't explain it, but every night I felt pursued by Him. I felt like he was knocking on the door of my heart. And that's where it starts. That's where it started for me. It wasn't in, in an exterior thing. It was in those quiet hours at night, laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, feeling my heart flutter because I was being pursued by Jesus. See, this whole love thing, this, this we need to love God and God wants to love us, that, that happens within us. It, it has to be the first thing. Because if you don't have the love of God in your heart, if you don't know how to love and accept His love for you, then there's nothing that can pour over. There's nothing that can flow out into what is the next step. And what makes this so significant and so special is, is this truth. This, this, is, this is why God wants our love. Jesus gave His life. You can go to the, Jesus gave His life for His subjects rather than asking His subjects to give their lives for Him. It's love. It's a love story between us and God. If you don't feel loved by God, I would love to help you feel loved by God because He loves you. Everything that He does, it starts between Him and you right here in your heart. That, that's an undeniable truth. And then one, once you have that seed planted in your heart and He designed it to be this way, 
He would plant these seeds in our hearts and we would begin to grow in love for Him and we would grow in receiving His love from us and then we would kind of move on to the next step and then that love would kind of overflow out of us and it would overflow onto others and then we have the next step which is to love others. And and this is why we don't do life alone. This is why community groups are important to us. But you know what? I'll tell you what, sometimes it just feels really good in life to know that somebody else loves you. Who's had a bad day that got worse, and then it continued to get worse, and then it got even worse, and then you got out of bed and started the day. (laughs) Yeah? You know, there's some days that you wake up and you just walk out and you just think, man, I would love to be loved by somebody. And, And maybe you can't accept the love that God has for you. Maybe you're not there. But the great thing is, is that God put love in someone else's heart so that they can intersect with your life and they can love you. We're desperate for this. We are. This drives everything that we do. It drives what you wear. It drives who you hang out with. It drives who you align with. It drives what, what makes you feel complete, what makes you feel whole. If you don't feel loved by people, you don't hang out with those people. If you feel loved by people, you want to hang out with them. You want to spend more time with them. It's it's, we were designed that way. We were designed to have a relationship with God, and then we were designed to have a relationship with each other. And this is so important. Now, we as the church in this room, we have this job to do. But this is a joy. It's a joyful job. We get to go out throughout our day and find people to love. We get to go throughout our day and find people that need to be loved, and then we get to love them. That should be contagious to watch somebody's day change from hard to love, to watch somebody change from from unaccepted to accepted. That that, that should catch us like a wildfire, and we should just be seeking people left and right to be able to do that. But that's, that's loving others, and this is so important that Jesus speaks this in his first commandment, or he speaks this when he sums up the commandments. And in John 13, we're going to read this here, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And then in verse 34, Jesus says this. He says, I'll tell you what. You're trying to pin me into an answer here because there were 613 commandments. That's a number that I've learned in the last month or so. 613 Old Testament commandments that came out of uh, the Ten Commandments. 613 of them. And they say, which one's the most important? How do you pick one out of 613? So what Jesus does is he dunks on all of them, and he says, well, I'm going to give you the one that encapsulates everything. And he says, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Love one another as I've loved you. You must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What sets us apart from others? What, sets, what makes you different? from another person? What makes this church different from a rugby game? Or what makes this gathering of people different from another gathering of people? You know, unfortunately, you know what churches are bad at doing? They're bad at loving others because they're too busy trying to make sure that others do it right when they walk into the building. And we need to flip that around, and we do that really well. You guys are amazing. I love inviting new people, and when new people come, because I know that they're coming into this amazing environment. But we will be known as disciples of Christ by the way that we love others. You know, that's just such an incredible truth for us. And and this is what has really started to kind of eat at my heart and eat at, at my soul and eat at who that I am, because I'm asking, Lord, am I doing this? Can we be doing something else to do this more and to do this for more and more people? And so then that brings us to the third step. See, Jesus has established the church. He's spoken into existence. And now he's giving us the the definition of what it is to be the church. And the last one, serve the world. It's, It's that it doesn't stop here. It goes out. It goes out from us. This isn't something that we do here in this building. And then on Monday morning, you turn off your church life and you turn on your work life. No, there's just one you. And when you love others, you do this and it goes beyond this church and it goes into the city, it goes into the scary places, it goes out everywhere. And in fact, something so significant happened when Jesus rose from the grave 
the church, when he spoke it into existence, he rose from the grave and something incredible happened. And that, that veil in the temple, it tore. And when that veil in the temple, it tore, it, it got rid of the separation between man and God. And now we all had direct access to God through what Jesus did. And so look, look at this statement right here. When Jesus unleashed his agenda for the church to the world, it broke through the walls of Judaism because before Jesus, you had to be a Jew and you had to go through the temple process to come to God. And you had to do all these things, 613 things to be known as clean, to come before God. And when Jesus unleashed his agenda, it broke through the walls of Judaism and it opened up to the whole world. So this is for everyone. You know, the, the danger here is when we start to decide who qualifies to be loved and who doesn't. That gets dangerous. Because I can promise you that at some point in your life or your day, you were one of those people that should not probably qualify to be loved by someone else's definition. I, I personally don't want another human deciding whether I'm qualified to be loved or not. I, I would much rather put, put my trust and my faith that God decides that I'm qualified to be loved. So now what do we do with all of this? We, we have a responsibility. Our responsibility is that we are the stewards of the movement that is the church. See, we have this incredible responsibility that we have to care for this generation of the church, and then we have to care for the next generation of the church. You know, I, well, here's what's going to happen. We, we have a, 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 a son that's at Rondebosch High School. It's the same at Saks. It's the same at Westerford. It's the same everywhere. But Jesus is, is not there. I'm not saying he's not moving in people's lives and he's not doing things because, because he is. But you know what? We're having to fight harder and harder and harder. And there's more and more churches out there that are dying out because their congregation gets old and their congregation dies and they realize there's no one else there to pick up with where the church is and to continue to take it on. See, we, we, we don't just care for this generation. It's not that you guys are very important to me, but it doesn't end with you. It's also the next generation. You know, as a pastor of this church, I, I hate the idea that I would one day hand this thing off and, and not set up the next person extremely, extremely well. And I hope that it's a younger generation that takes this thing and takes it to the next level. That's our responsibility. We get to choose that. The world does not choose whether or not we take the church out into the world. We, we make that decision. And the world may make it hard, but ultimately it's our decision. And so as South Point Church, and this is where it's great, even if you're new, for you to know this specifically. As South Point Church, here's our purpose. Our purpose is to inspire people to follow Jesus. That's us. It's not complicated. We want to inspire everyone to follow Jesus. And the why is because we believe that everyone needs Jesus. See, there's not a person that doesn't need Jesus. And there's not a person that we don't hope to inspire to follow Jesus. And so with this purpose in mind and with this why in mind, that brings me to these cards that you have on your, on your chair. And I'll put a picture up here. I'm, I'm excited about these. So I'm really excited about these. Uh, they, they, they took about, you know, two minutes for me to make, for me to put together. So not a ton of effort went into this. But there's a lot behind this card. There's a lot that, that, that is in the words that are on this card here. See, a couple weeks ago, I started to talk about the empty chair. And, and the empty chair that's in the room. And, and as I talked about this empty chair, I talked about, I mean, we should have a burden for this. You know, last week I made a, a bold statement, but one that I fully believe in is that if we go another year as a church without baptisms and salvations, then we're not actually being the church. We either need to redefine what we are or we need to redefine what we do to match the definition of what we are. If we say that we're a church, that our purpose is to inspire people to, to follow Jesus and our why is because everyone needs Jesus, then how can we be in a city of 6 million people and be okay with 200 people in here? It's not okay. I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that because it's a numbers game, because I want to feel good because we have a, a full room in here. No, I'm not okay with that because every single empty chair in this room represents a person that could be sitting here. 
It represents a person that could have an encounter with the fact that God loves them. That's our purpose. Why are we here? We're here because people need Jesus. Our purpose? Our purpose is to inspire you into a relationship with Jesus. Even if it's just during a song, you come in here unloved and you feel a little bit more loved. That's our purpose. See, you, you have the world out there and it does all kinds of stuff to you. But in here, when you come here, or you meet with a community group, or you're a part of some kind of serve opportunity that we have, or you volunteer on a team, you need to feel wrapped in love. You need to feel wrapped in God's love. And you need, you need to feel wrapped in the love that we, as a church, have for each other. And so, what this card means to me, this is so special to me, because it speaks to such a strong burden that I have. And, and I know if you're sitting here, you may be thinking, like, you know, I'm kind of over this empty chair thing. Like, I come every Sunday. Well, you know what? You come every Sunday, and you have a place to come to every Sunday because there were people before me that had a burden for you. You sit in a chair that at one point was empty, and somebody had a burden that that chair would be filled. And because of that burden that your chair was filled, you're here. And so I don't want to stop there. I don't want us to stop there. And see, I, I wrote this to say, I will save you a seat. Because this statement, I will save you a seat, implies that we are being the church. It's not just, hey, here, come to South Point Church. Here's a card. Come and join us. Hope to see you there. And, and that's easy because then, you know what, people say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go. And then you can say, hey, I did my thing. You know, I invited someone to church. And there we go. And, you know, here I am being the church. And ah, they don't show up. And, man, no one wants to come to church anymore. No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about here. This idea of I will save you a seat is saying it's I. I am going to take some ownership of seeing you, loving you, recognizing you, inviting you, and then I'm going to walk the journey with you. So it's not just come to church. It's I will save you a seat. Come. I've got a seat saved for you. Come. I love you and I care about you. You can sit next to me. Come and be a part of this because I, I've got a spot that's open and that's available for you. See, I will save you a seat. That, that's like our, our discipleship model. It's like, let's do things together. Let's do life together. See, we, we need to continue to remember why we're here. So I asked this question last week. I ask it this week. Why are we here? We are here because somebody that came before us created an opportunity for us to be here. We're here because somebody said, hey, come, I'll save you a seat. I know so many people that are here because they were invited to be here. That's incredible. Come, I'll save you a seat. There were people that came before us that make it easy for us to be here. Why else are we here? Because God's spoken into existence. Is there somebody that you know that you would love to say, hey, I'd love for you to come and be a part of this love that, that I experience here in this building, but you know, I'm kind of afraid to ask them. Well, you know what? Just remember that Jesus spoke this into existence. That means it's real. That means it works. So we shouldn't be afraid or ashamed to invite people to it. In fact, I, I've got a quick, a quick example for you and then I'll get ready to wrap up. Let's say you're standing on the train line and as the train is, is going by, you know that if you step out in front of that train, you're going to get hit by that train and, and probably die, right? No one's debating that. No one can, can morph through objects. This is not the Avengers or a Disney special. This is like you, stand, you step in front of a train, you get hit, you die. And so if you're watching somebody else that stands in front of a train and then steps in front of the train, what are you going to do? You're going to run like crazy. You're going to yell. You're going to do everything you can to get them off the tracks. Why? Because you know that if they don't, they'll die. Same with someone that wants to jump off a big ledge. If you had an opportunity to grab every person before they did that, before they took that leap, then you would. Because you know that if they jump, that they're gone. They're going to die. And so how can we, now I'm speaking mostly to our, our church, our insiders. If we know that if you live a life without Jesus, then your life is not going to be uh, living to the fulfillment of its potential. 
And in fact, if you live a life without Jesus and the day that you die, we know that you're going to miss that opportunity to be in heaven and eternal love with a heavenly Father that loves you. If we know that to be true, then how can we go another year without baptisms and salvations? We can't be okay with watching people just step off into the tracks. We can't be okay with watching people step off a ledge. Because to say that, you know what, I see someone that's about to step into the train tracks, but you know what, that's, hey, that's their decision, you know. I don't want to be politically incorrect. I'm going to let them, you know, they can do their own thing. You decide what you want to do with your life, your life, your body, your thing. That's up to you. No. No matter who they were, you would run and you would pull them from the tracks. And that, that's what I'm trying to, to wrap my head around for myself and for the church of why are we here if we know and we believe and we understand what Jesus has done for us and what the consequences are when we don't let Jesus love us, when we don't tell others about the love of Jesus, when we don't do this thing that Jesus spoke into existence, which is be the church, then why are we here? Because that's why we're here. And then now this brings me to the last part, the empty chair. This is something, I'm going to speak this until it becomes part of our culture. I'm going to speak this so much that when you lay down at night, I want your last thought to be my voice talking about the empty chair. We're going to say it over and over and over and over again. In fact, we printed over 200 cards and stuck on every single one of your chairs. Why? Because the empty chair matters. Why? Because I wanted to equip you with something easy that you could pull off the chair and you could give to somebody and say, hey, you know what? Come to church with me. I'll save you a seat. Come to church with me. I'll do it with you. You meet somebody that's getting, that hasn't gone through next and you tell them about next. Say, hey, you know what? Next is coming up next month. It's on the 12th. Why don't you come and be a part of that? And hey, I tell you what, I'm going to go with you. I'll sit on that. I'll sit in on that with you. Now, I would love for us to have, have next champions that at the end of the year they can say I went through next 13 times this year you know why because I care about the empty chair why because I care about people so th this is my hope and this is the last thing I'll say before I pray my hope is that we at South Point Church are not just it's not South Point is that we act as the thing that Jesus spoke into existence. And that is that we are going to let ourselves be filled with the love of God. We are going to overflow that love of God onto others. And then we are going to take that and we are going to go out and take it to the ends of the world. And when we do that, we're going to be so filled with the burden that when we look around this room and we see the empty chairs, that we say, man, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for somebody else Six million people out there and less than 200 in here. We got a lot of people out there that need Jesus. We got a lot of people out there that need to understand how much he loves them. And that is our role as the church. And we have all kinds of ways that we can do that. But if it doesn't start here in me and then in our staff and then in our volunteers and then in you guys, well, then, then we're never going to get it. It has to start here. So my prayer and my hope for today's message is, and my, my prayer and my hope for sticking all these cards on your chairs, which me and my son Lifa went through this morning and sticky tacked every single one of those cards on there. His thumb is probably bruised from pushing it on there. But why? Because the empty chair matters. Why does the empty chair matter? Because it should be filled with somebody new that's getting a, a chance to recognize how much God loves them. So, I'm going to pray for us, but just before I do, and when I pray, the band will come out. I just want to encourage you with this. I want you to look around and see all the empty chairs that are in the room. And every, your chair has a card on it, and then all the empty chairs have cards on it. Now, what I would love to happen is after the service is over, I would love to walk out of this auditorium and see no more cards on any chairs. Because I would love for people to say, you know what, God? While this last worship song is playing, I would love for you to say, you know what, God? You've put three or four people on my heart, or, or you know what? I'm going to go take three or four of those cards, and I'm going to do everything I can this year to fill those seats so that they're not empty chairs. And so as we pray, I want you to pray about that. Could God be asking you 
to, to act as the church, that he spoke into existence, which means it's bulletproof. It means that nothing can overcome it. It means you have everything at, at, that's behind you, no obstacles, nothing in the way. Could you have somebody on your heart, on your mind, that you could say, hey, I'll save you a seat. Come, come into this environment of love. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you.